Well, the day that many have anticipated or expected or wished for has arrived, and uh, certainly you all know what I'm talking about. Uh, now Iowa will uh, continue to pursue a championship in the Big Ten and then move beyond um, on the offensive side of the ball to look for a new uh, man to lead the offense. And we will discuss here at Hawkeyes Live right here at the Boys of College Football. We appreciate you all being here. Leave those comments and questions there in the chat. Please consider contributing here at the Voice of College Football and also Corey's work at, from the Hawkeye of the Storm, Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App, and also the Super Chat is available as well. Corey, how you doing? Doing good, Mark. Been a busy two days. Um, yesterday was was obviously wild, uh, and on top of it, we had uh, men's basketball, first game of the season. That's an exhibition, so it didn't count to the season, but it short post game for that. So, uh, and I already had a previously scheduled Hawkeye hangout live show scheduled with, with coach Patterson. So it was a busy day and we got Kirk today, uh, presser. I had talked on Monday about maybe running down to Iowa city. There was just no way this morning after my, uh, night last night that I was going to make it down there four and a half hour drive round trip and then come back for this. And then I've got an obligation Tuesday evening. So wasn't going to happen. And frankly, I'm glad I didn't because you knew that. I mean, the, the press conference was going to be packed full of questions and uh, you know, I don't need to run down there and throw, throw my ring in the, in the hat, so to speak. But uh, yeah, uh, this, it need to happen. This needed to happen. It's, it's needed, been needed for quite some time. Here we are about 24 hours removed from the initial news that Brian would not be returning for the 2024 season. And Mark, I I'll admit, and people can say I'm a sympathizer and apologist, I feel bad for Brian. I feel bad for Brian. I feel bad for Kirk. I think that's a natural human response to the situation. Um, I tweeted this morning that multiple things can be true at the same time. One of which being this move needed to happen, whether it was now, whether it was before the season, obviously end of last season would have been preferable or at the end of this season. The bottom line is the move is being made and that's another step in the right direction. But at the same time, I can also say, I have full confidence. Brian loves this university. He's a former player. Uh, he's been coaching here for a long time now uh, in total. And I do feel bad for him. Um, but I think he'll get on his feet. My guess is he'll get a job somewhere in the league and probably be an O-line coach at some point if he's not one right away. Uh, and maybe he'll get another chance of being a coordinator in college. He's only like 40 years old. Um, so you never know. Um, but uh, this is a step in the right direction. I felt bad for Kirk watching him today during his media availability, um, but I thought he handled himself well and answered all questions as best you would expect him to in this situation. He had some uh, cheerful banter, which is kind of typical of a Kirk press conference, even though I'm sure it was a very, very hard day to appear before the media and all those cameras. Yeah, certainly, yeah. Uh, folks, anybody listening, anyone watching right now who has not had an opportunity to really dive into um, – what has transpired, obviously knowing the news itself, but not the discussion and so forth. Check out all of Corey's work at, uh, from the Hawkeye of the storm. Uh, I posted, uh, my thoughts, uh, that video is available on the main channel as well. And I, I said the same thing that, uh, regardless of where you stand on his work, um, you know, I don't want to, and don't take any joy in anyone getting fired unless they, have done something dishonest or there's been some kind of misconduct, but in no way do I think that um, Brian Ferentz was negligible in any way in regards to his effort, his uh, giving his very best to, to do his best uh, for a school that presumably he loves. And as you mentioned, attended and uh, played for. So yeah, that, that uh, you said it very well in regards to um that being just indescribably difficult for Kirk to then have to go through that situation, face the media and, you know, answer all those questions. So I'm going to start because there's so many things we could talk about and, and I can't imagine we're going to cover anything here <laughs> that you did not cover. Uh, I certainly was pretty exhaustive in my thoughts for, I was comprehensive. I, I could have talked a lot more uh, about the job that Brian Ferentz did and and why this was necessary myself. But I'll start with this. Were you surprised? 
I was surprised with the timing. I mean, I, I know it was being tossed around. The rumblings were out there over the weekend, it sounds like. Uh, I never got wind of those rumblings until early Monday morning. Um, and so, yeah, I was surprised with the timing of it. And if you're going to do something during a bye week, you would think you maybe do it last week and give everybody an extra week to prep. Um, there is, you know, there I saw some people sent me a theory on social media that, you know, this was not meant to be publicized at this point, but it got leaked. And so Iowa had to kind of transition and announce it earlier than they wanted to. But the conversations, the decisions were already made. I don't necessarily believe that. But again, I don't know. Um, I think Beth Getz deserves a lot of credit. I saw a former player as somebody, again, people send me these things all the time. I don't follow a bunch of people on Twitter or on Instagram, but somebody sent me either a tweet or a Snapchat or something of a former former Iowa fullback who will remain nameless, um, ripping into Beth Getz about how she's cowardly and how it was a, a pathetic move on her part to do this at this point in the season. All I can say to that, and I don't know this former player personally, um, that's – ridiculous in my opinion um you know people have been chiming for this move for so long and we're really going to complain because the move took place four games before the end of a season in which the offense is dead last in the fps i understand that there may be some downsides to this but there are also positives making this move in late october as opposed to waiting until december one thing mark as you well know the transfer portal window opens in early december so you're talking basically right after regular season is done, you have this portal opening where guys are going to be throwing their names in that portal. And who's to say that guys don't have their minds made up. I mean, I, I know uh, just having a conversation the other day with a division one player, uh, not at Iowa, but a division one FBS player that basically told me he's planning on entering the portal when that window opens We're in October. Uh, so some guys make up their minds early and, this at least gives Iowa some time to possibly convince some of those players who are thinking about leaving to stay. And, you know, I'm not saying the offense is going to look any different in the next four months, but at least, at least people, I don't know if that's Kirk or who would be kind of convincing these players, just the move itself could convince somebody to reconsider uh, going somewhere else with the hopes that, Hey, maybe Iowa brings in someone that I'm more compatible with that I think will get this offense going specifically the passing game. I think that's, you know, wide receiver play, quarterback play, those are really the two positions that um, we have seen Iowa struggle recruiting at the most, although they've done decent at quarterback. They haven't developed guys. So, uh, you know, that might be part of it. And the other part of it is, you know, 20 years ago, Mark, we didn't have this early signing day in December. And although I don't think this will uh, change things, like I don't know that Brian being let go in early December would have made a whole lot of difference but I think it's fair to the players that are committed already to know, hey, this change is happening. As opposed to letting them sign in December, they play a bowl game two weeks later, and then he's gone. Hey, we're, we're getting rid of the guy you just signed to play for. So again, those are all variables. I just don't agree with that take. And I think people who say that or are making those comments against Beth Getz are in the minority. I think a lot of people have applauded Beth Getz. This was most likely uh, pressure to above Beth. That's based on a number of um, things that I've heard. It sounds like there was some pressure, and she even mentioned it in her email that President Wilson was involved with this decision. And, um, you know, who knows what the big donors, you've been talking about those big donors in the poll that they have with this program. Who knows what what donors, if any, were kind of pressuring Beth to make this move, even though she's the interim AD. And my guess is she was given reassurance or assurance that she had the power as the interim AD to make this move as she did. And I actually thought she handled it the way I would have liked her to handle it. Again, you can debate on whether or not the move should have been made in a few weeks or in a month and a half or now. But I, I do appreciate the fact that she didn't mince words in her release. She said, I have informed Brian this. This is not Kirk's decision. This is not Brian's decision. It's my decision. And based on what I was told, Brian was given the opportunity to just resign. And he chose not to. I mean, that's his prerogative. I don't blame him for that. Um, certainly, if the option was, hey, we want you to resign during the middle of the season or I'm going to let you go, I can see why Brian wouldn't want to resign midseason. That makes sense to me. So whatever the reason was, uh, maybe he wouldn't have resigned in December or January either. But um, I commend Beth for how she's handled it because, again, I'm not behind closed doors. 
but it's a difficult position to be in. She addressed the media today as she should. All right. She addressed the media, didn't really give too many exorbitant answers. Um, I applaud Kirk for addressing the media. I have no problem with him withholding players this week. No problem at all with that. I think that's wise. And I think that's a coach who's been coaching a long, long time. And as the Dean of College Football that understands that this could become a distraction, it's not, you know, trying to protect Brian or protect Kirk. Kirk faced the media today, um, but he doesn't want his players to be bombarded with questions about Brian Ferentz. How is that fair to them? Let them focus on the game this Saturday. It's going to be a, a test on the road against a dangerous Northwestern team that's proven they can score points and make big plays. And it's also in a weird venue at Wrigley. Um, and Iowa's coming off a bye week. So, you know, I, I don't have any problem with that. I'll be anxious to see if we get Brian in the final month of the year because here's the deal, Mark. The media has gotten access to a bunch of assistants every Wednesday morning throughout the season. Last year, we got Brian like week one after the the uh, win against South Dakota State. This year, we have not gotten Brian yet. We've gotten Abdul Hodge. We've gotten Liddell Betts. We've gotten George Barnett. Um, we've gotten L Kelton Copeland. I believe we've gotten Phil Parker and LeVar Woods. I, we've got to be getting close to the only other guy left, which would be Brian. So it'll be interesting to see how they handle media with him. But here's what I'll say, and I, I complimented Brian yesterday, um, last night on the show, and I'll say it again. People know I have been very critical of Kirk, very critical of Brian as it relates to this offense. And I'm not the only one, of course, that's been critical of those two guys as it relates to the offense performance in recent time. But I will say this. Um, I believe that Brian will coach as hard as he has throughout his entire tenure. He'll coach as hard as he ever has this last month, month and a half of the season. And he will face the media. Um, I, I doubt he's going to cower away and avoid uh, the camera, so to speak. Um, I don't believe that Brian is a coward. Um, I believe, again, like I said earlier, that he loves this university. And frankly, Mark, I could see this. I don't think we're going to see some drastic shift in play calling these final four weeks of the season. But here's what I will say. And this is me going out limb because we don't see this much from Iowa in general. If they make the Big Ten championship game and they probably need to go they need to go at least nine and three to do that. Probably go 10 and two. They probably need to win these last four games. And they're playing in Ohio State or a Michigan in the Big Ten title game. My guess is Brian will throw everything he possibly can at that East Division opponent because it may be Brian's last chance in the national spotlight as a play caller of a Big Ten football team. Think about that. Like, why wouldn't you? We've, we've talked about that in the past. Why wouldn't you throw everything you have at Michigan in the Big Ten Championship game in 2021? And they really didn't. Um, I don't think they did. They had a trick play or two, but got beat 42-3 to three and didn't really have any wrinkles the last three quarters of the game. My guess is that they get, make it to the Big Ten Championship game. We will see Iowa take some unorthodox shots, and that could produce an interesting game in early December against an elite opponent, maybe. So first of all, with uh, Beth Getz and the move that she made, uh, I would agree that it's not cowardly. If anything, uh, I could understand possibly some other criticisms of it, although I don't have any, but cowardly would be the last thing. That would be the last place where I would go. If anything, uh, again, depending on where this, where this originated, this, move, whether it was thrust upon her or she very much was in on thinking in that direction, you know, she's an interim AD that could throw up her hands and say, I was inherited this. We're going to let the football season ride out. And we're six and two, not that she would say this publicly, but be thinking, why does there need to be a move made? I'm not going to get in the middle of something that I inherited this mess. We'll deal with it in the off season. So I thought it was the, the move that needed to be made, the move that was made, and I, I read her statement and, and other statements, and I, I have absolutely no criticism of how she handled it. Um, I would but say you, that... You could say that, that you could see other criticisms. So what would those other criticisms of the situation be? Well, you, you in a sense, went there with uh, various aspects of whether this becomes a distraction to the players um, having a coach who's a lame duck coach running the offense for the remainder of the season, but you also lined up the positives dealing with recruiting, 
the early signing period, the transfer portal. I think all those things point to this being a more positive direction and decision to be made going forward. Uh, and not just as it relates to the 2023 season, because hopefully it doesn't impact or maybe impacts in a positive way the 23 season. Maybe it galvanizes the offense. Maybe it um, lights a fire under Brian in some way. I, I don't know that it needs to. I think he's doing his very best. Uh, but, you know, stranger things have happened in just adding a little juice, a little fire under them. Well, first of all, um... You know, the idea that and I thought idea was tossed around at the press conference today to Kirk Ferentz. And I understand the question, the idea of maybe, you know, this being a distraction to offensive players. And although I agree with Kirk this week, taking the players away from the media, because there's just no there, there's just no reason to risk anything as it relates to the game on Saturday. But with that being said, the reason the other reason why I would say I don't have a problem with the move being made when it was made, the offense is dead last in the FBS. They turned the ball over three times against Minnesota at home the other day. Um, they have they turned the ball over against Michigan State with Deacon Hill. In fact, it was brought up by a, a reporter today at that press conference that Deacon, by some statistics, is considered to be the most turnover-prone FBS quarterback in the country. Well, I don't know how accurate that is. We've seen a somewhat small sample size from him. But, you know, I know this sounds cliche, but how can it get worse? You know, maybe it can. But, okay, players get distracted. What's that going to do? They're going to turn the ball over eight times? Like, at some point, there's only – you can only go up, right? Uh, I don't think we risk falling any further by making a move at this point. And you're right. Maybe it ignites people. Maybe it ignites players to play for Brian. I don't know how close of a relationship – I'm sure there's guys that are close to, to Brian. I sure would hope so. Um, and maybe it ignites Brian. I hope it does. I hope he uses this as an audition – you know, maybe integrating his tight ends, uh, even though he's down a couple of his best tight ends, showing off. Maybe he gets a tight ends coaching job in in the league, or you know, maybe that run game starts clicking again, and um, you know that would obviously help him potentially with his resume as an offensive line guy. He's a former center himself, so yeah, I just don't have any issue with it. And it took, I mean, it's Beth Getz is still putting herself out there, regardless if she was pressured and basically told by Barbara Wilson and whoever the powers that may be behind this, that, hey, you got to make this decision. Or if it was her decision primarily, it's putting yourself out there. Gary Barta didn't have the spine to do this for the last three years. You know, and he'd been around the program, the AD, for forever, it felt like. She comes in, and three months into the job, she makes the move that most people um, want. And by the way, I think... You know, I, I don't can't speak for that former player that posted about uh, how upset that player was about the the move and how Beth gets performed this move. Some people I think are so wrapped into their po political thinking that they equate uh, a move like this with uh, they equate that with how certain politicians may fold to pressure from the people, right? And that's one thing that was brought up. I don't know if it was the player or someone else said that, you know, she folded to pressure from the people. I, I don't know why we have to look at this with a political view in mind whatsoever. Uh, we all sitting here as fans or analysts, we're looking at the offense, looking at the numbers, looking at the last three years, looking at the eye test, production, the development, all these things we have been saying for a long time, they need change here. And no one's claiming that Brian's the only problem, believe me. But uh, I don't know how you could potentially move forward without making a change at OC. And so, um, you know, uh, best wishes to Brian. I, I have nothing against Brian. I, I hope him, I wish him the best. And I doubt he ever coaches again at Iowa in any form. But uh, I hope he has success and ends up achieving whatever whatever his dreams are for himself. I hope he ends up achieving them. Now, rarely do I endorse making a decision uh, based on public perception. And I know that this wasn't there's the, the performance obviously has dictated what the move needed to be. Um, but in regards to the public perception, I don't know that Iowa fans by and large really understand what the calling card of this team has become nationally. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that I brought up in, in the video that I shot was by knowledgeable college football fans and media what this team is known for is great defense 
and elite special teams play and that the offense is dragging it down, but there's a balanced view of how good Iowa is overall and what the, the obvious strengths and weaknesses are. But to average Joe college football fan who doesn't even know maybe sometimes who Iowa even played the past Saturday, or maybe they just look at it because they know that the offensive totals are going to be anemic. Um, and, and you know that I've got a certain perspective on this because I talk to college football people, media that cover other teams. And the first thing that comes to mind, what has become the brand of this program, and it's not right, it's not fair, it's not just, it's not earned to a large degree is, yeah, they're the program that has this horrendous offense and it's a joke and it's unbelievably bad and they don't do anything about it. By the way, uh, you had some Yahoo post on your video from last night, which, by the way, I, I enjoyed. I actually fell asleep to it early this morning, so thank you for that. But um, <laughs> that, you had that's quite the endorsement. You had some Yahoo comment on uh, the video, and made the and I responded to this person. Darn, that means Iowa might become a good program in the future. And I responded mm -hmm. and said, uh, the idea that Iowa hasn't been a good program is simply ignorant. Now yeah. you could say that good is in the you know lies in the the eye of the beholder, um, and and that's what this individual responded. Well, you know my definition of, of good is clearly different than yours. I was been a consistent top thirty program in the FBS since Kirk took over here, and I mean again top thirty and out of one hundred and thirty FBS teams approximately throughout his tenure, that's good. Now it's not elite. No one's claiming that it's elite, but I think ninety percent of college football, the college football world, would say Iowa has been a good program. At the minimum, they've been a good program. Um, so anyways, you know. And I think top 30 is being rather conservative myself. Well, and that's right. I was being rather conservative. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They've had years where they, they did finish in the top, you know, 10, certainly the top 25. Another question I have for you, and I don't, I'm guessing that anything I bring up, you've already talked about it ad nauseum, but still I'm going to hit you with this because this struck me as well. So we often see coaching changes made during a bye week for obvious reasons. You get a jump on the preparation for the next week, whether that's it's mostly going to be somebody internal that's going to take over. If, in fact, this is a change that's made um, in, in which this person's dismissed immediately, that's typically what happens. Uh, so this happens in a bye week. However, it didn't happen you know, the day or two days after the Minnesota game, usually there's, there's an understanding that we're, we're at this breaking point. Okay. Another loss or another example of offensive ineptitude, whatever the case is for that particular situation, then, okay, let's gather everyone, make sure we got our ducks in a row. We all in, agree. This is the time. Okay. There's a full close to two weeks before the next game. Well, here we have a full week passes before the decisions made official and announced. I'm just wondering about, do you wonder if there was pushback from Kirk in any way that delayed this decision? Uh, that's possible. That's possible. Like I said, it sounds like it was brewing before yesterday. I can tell you that. And I think it's pretty clear. Kirk doesn't agree with the decision. Brian doesn't agree with the decision. And that's their prerogative. I do appreciate Kirk using the term today, chain of command. I, I thought that was his best response to every question he had during today's press conference. He brought up the late Hayden John Fry, and he brought up how Hayden used to talk about the chain of command. And he referred to, you know, he was kind of uh, initiating the military type of thought thinking with chain of command. And Kirk just said, you know, there's a chain of command with everything here. And uh, basically acknowledging that this was out of his hands. He He respects the fact that there are people above him. And I thought it was a good response, whether he feels that or not. I think he does. I think he 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 actually does. He, he's not happy about it, but he was not disrespectful to Beth Getz during the press conference. The other thing that may have been happening last week, Mark, in response to that loss to Minnesota, is it perhaps a situation where given how they lost to Minnesota, you knew Iowa was going to consult with the Big Ten, even they got a overturn from the NCAA on that targeting call against Carson Shire, but, of course, the the overturn against Cooper DeGene was so fresh, and we were talking about it all week long. Is it possible that maybe this announcement, you know, they didn't want to make the announcement 
coming off that melee, right? I, I could see that being the case sure. as well. Yeah, there was a lot to deal with in the aftermath of, of that game and not just being, okay, it was another game, another win, another loss in just a standard fashion. There was obviously, you know, we're talking about the most controversial call in college football this season. Um, and you wonder if they win that game, if that play stands, they don't lose the game. They're seven and one right now. The offensive numbers and metrics are exactly the same if this move is made. And Beth Guess was she was asked about that today. Would this move had been made had Iowa been seven and one right now? And basically she responded the way she should respond. She said, uh, well, I'm not, you know, here to talk about what could have happened, what would have happened. And she said that several times. Basically, I'm not here to talk about hypotheticals. I'm not here to share what happened behind closed doors. That's what she's supposed to say. Yes. She's not going to say that, well, when I made the announcement, you know, Brian got up and locked the door and started pounding his fist on the table. I mean, we don't know what happened. We don't need to know what happened. Of course, the media is obligated to ask those questions. But um, so far, Beth has impressed me in a lot of ways. And I'm wondering how long it's going to take for them to remove that interim tag. I'd be shocked if they go anywhere else other than Beth gets at this point. Corey, there's one other aspect of this I'd like to get to and ask your opinion on before we bring in Bradley Locker. We've got uh, Bradley coming in from inside the U uh, to talk um, inside NU to talk uh, Northwestern football and the, the matchup Saturday. Once I started to read some of the stories, um, you know, there, there was nothing in the background of these stories, obviously that is, that was any surprise to me or information that I didn't know. You know, I don't cover the the team like you do, but I've got a pretty good handle on, you know, what the results have been, what, the, what the offense has looked like and all that business. Uh, but I do not remember us addressing at the time comments that Beth gets made in August, in particular, maybe at other various times, but in August in particular, that really highlight that she wasn't going to come out and slam the contract stipulation and the way it was worded and that there was just a clause and a bonus involved. But her wording, pretty much you can read into, she thought that it was strange. She used words like, this is a different type, unique situation. And then there was another phrase she used that was stronger than that, that especially in the aftermath really shows what she thought of that contract and, stipulation. And um, I will say this, uh, it was brought up, I believe it was the Wisconsin post game. Um, we, I was up in Madison and did a post game prior to my show with Don. And I had somebody call in and ask why I commented that the contract was not necessarily initiated by Gary Barta. And this person was just shocked that I would say that. And I said, well, based on what I've been told, it wasn't. It wasn't a Gary Barta decision outright. There were other people at play here. And Kirk, and, and I, I basically at the time just said, look, I, I'm not commenting. I don't have liberty to comment further. Kirk basically said today, the con a lot of the contract uh, makeup was initiated by Brian. So there's your answer. So people wanted to call me crazy when I said that two weeks ago. Kirk brought that up today, and that's consistent with what I had been told. It was not necessarily the, the contract itself, the 25 point per game thing, the seven wins. That was not just a Gary Barta decision. And Gary, you know, obviously he was involved with that. And I think Beth, had, like you said, has shown that she doesn't necessarily approve of the stipulations of that contract. And that could also bring us to another possibility as to why. Beth wanted to make the decision now. And this may be the most unlikely of the scenarios as to why she did this. But is it possible? I mean, they it's clear that they were going to hit the 25 point per game mark anyways. But is it possible that Beth wanted to make the call now to make it clear we're not letting him go because of the contract? The contract is ridiculous. That's that's not why we're letting him go. That's not how we evaluate our personnel. Kirk you know, we keep getting, I think it's, it's almost humorous and I understand why it's, it's questioned this way, but Kirk has repeatedly asked about how he evaluates his staff. And more often than not, that's referencing, that's signaling, you know, how are you going to evaluate Brian per the nepotism rules? Kirk was never supposed to be the one evaluating Brian. That's the whole problem with the situation. It was supposed to be the AD. 
And so regardless of, you know, Kirk has said, well, I don't deviate from, I don't try, I try not to deviate from the practice of, of letting guys go during the middle of the season. He stayed consistent with that because this was not his decision. This was, you know, and it never was supposed to be his decision. Um, so I just wonder if perhaps this was Beth Getz's way of saying, hey, this this isn't how we evaluate either. I know that's not how Kirk evaluates, but Gary's gone. He was part of the, you know, he obviously was in on this with Brian and with Kirk when the contract was made up initially. This is not how I am going to evaluate Brian as his immediate overseer, his boss, basically. And so I've seen enough to make a decision now, regardless of what happens the last four games. That, that's possible as well. It is quite a race in the Big Ten Western Division. We've got four teams at three and two. We've got Northwestern a game back. And of course, the Hawkeyes and the Wildcats get together on Saturday at Wrigley Field. We've got uh, Bradley Locker on the line. You can catch him on Inside NU on SB Nation. Bradley, how are you doing today? What's up, guys? Thanks so much for having me on. Doing pretty well. It's a fun Halloween. It was actually snowing here in Evanston, so I don't know about where you guys are, but a little uncharacteristic. I almost felt like it was Christmas time, even though it's a little premature for that. But I saw Dave Revson's post today. He was not happy about it, and um, I, I'm not planning on being at Wrigley Field uh, this weekend. I actually had the fleeting thought of, of seeing what tickets are like and running over there. Um, I People who know me know I I've covered a couple of games in the press box. And just from my personal standpoint, it's first of all, I don't know what it'd be like covering a football game at Wrigley field from the press box. Um, what is the press box like at, at Wrigley? Have you been there before Bradley? I actually have. I covered a Northwestern Notre Dame baseball game at Wrigley field last spring. So that was pretty conventional. All things considered, it was a lot emptier of course than a usual Wrigley field press box would be. But I think what's going to be weird is that, uh, there's no home plate per se that's directly aligned with a press box. It's probably going to be uh, one of the corners of the end zone and a diagonal kind of view, um, whereas we're more accustomed to looking closer to the 50-yard line, maybe being at the 40-yard line from the press box. And I think we may, as the media, get a chance to kind of review the setup and how things are going to work this upcoming Friday. But I think, yeah, that's that's an interesting part for me because when, these two, when Northwestern played at Wrigley Field in 2021, I won as a fan uh, in the bleachers and – uh, kind of in the outfield traditionally of, of Wrigley. So it wasn't totally exactly the same viewpoint. So that's going to be pretty unique for sure. 33 degrees right now in Chicago, but 58 for a high on Saturday. Got yeah, it. The warm air is moving through. It's been, you guys are getting the cold air that we've had the last couple of days, but yeah, it's supposed to warm up and I don't know how long that will last, but at least through Saturday, it sounds like. And uh, this is an intriguing game, not only because of the fact that it's being played at Wrigley, but, Northwestern's ability to score points. I mean, they scored 21 points against Minnesota here a couple of weeks ago in a comeback victory, win in overtime. Um, they won on explosive plays against a Maryland team last week that is known for making explosive plays. It's also a Maryland team that's known for kind of, uh, I don't even know, what. Would, how would you quantify what Maryland does year after year under, uh, what's his face, Mark? Would you say <laughs> they kind of fold like a wet paper bag? There you the got it. But, you could uh, go that range. Yeah. But they are known for big plays, and I'm just yep. surprised with a – New quarterback, obviously, we know about the storylines with Pat Fitzgerald at Northwestern. They've been able to produce the offense they have. No, that's definitely fair. I think the offensive production, especially with Brendan Sullivan under center, the the backup for Northwestern has been very surprising. Um, last week in particular, he really did not look all that comfortable nor effective against Nebraska out in Lincoln. Uh, left some points out on the board. There was a particularly egregious misread where tight end Marshall Lang was wide open in the flat, and Sullivan really never saw him, and then Northwestern had to kick a field goal on that drive. It was a very bitter game for Northwestern, a lot of bad tastes and left in the mouths of players, of uh, fans, of coaches, really everybody affiliated with the program. And David Braun has done just an absolutely amazing job at allowing this team to reset, come out with a fire under it after a loss. And I think that's what we saw from the get-go against Maryland. Northwestern scored 14 points in the first quarter, um, which had not happened in quite a long time. I think it actually – and the Wildcats on top of that scored 24 in the first half. And they hadn't done that in three years since they last took on Maryland at Ryan Field. So maybe that's just something about playing Ryan, uh, playing Maryland at Ryan Field. Um, but I think we saw much more poise and, and comfortable Brennan Sullivan in the pocket. I still think Northwestern's offense has plenty of areas to improve. And I think the coaches would say the same thing. The running game has really been very ineffective for much of the season. A combination of bad run blocking and running backs that haven't been super um, – I guess really elusive in the hole, nor able to hit the hole quickly. 
Um, but I think the passing offense with Bryce Kurtz, AJ Henning, Cam Johnson has really taken strides this year under new receivers coach Armand Bins. Um, Going to be a much tougher matchup against the Hawkeyes and their stingy secondary and defense overall compared to Maryland, which lost two NFL draft corners. But um, no, I, I think I think that offensive production has been a very bright spot and to some extent with some areas for room to improve too. Yeah, so exactly. The last time we talked to you was prior to the Nebraska game and Northwestern gets two interceptions right out of the gate in the first six or seven minutes. Can't do much with it. I think they get a field goal off of one. It's a very ugly, low scoring, tight to the vest kind of game. And then Malachi Coleman gets behind someone late and uh, widens the gap. And then to see the team explode to a certain extent. And, you know, I'm I'm using you know, in the Northwestern realm exploding on offense. And that's not an insult because it, it's, as I stated to you a couple of weeks ago, just rather impressive what this team's done this season uh, to be in contention, to be, you know, now defeating teams like Minnesota and Maryland. Um, could you see any kind of talent difference between those two teams on the field? Because it's supposed to be uh, that way and Northwestern is supposed to be uh, at a decided disadvantage against just about anyone and especially a team like Maryland. I mean, I think there's no doubt that Maryland for sure, as you mentioned, is just a, a better team point blank than Northwestern. And I, I, I think you can't also ignore the fact that Maryland just played a pretty bad football game in a lot of ways against Northwestern. Uh, Talia Tungavailoa did not really look very accurate or comfortable, which is uncharacteristic of him and what we've seen over the course of his career. Now, I guess it's a few straight weeks where he hasn't really looked like his usual self, but there's there's a play that I think in particular stands out from that game where Maryland was driving down the field um, with basically inside of two minutes to go, no timeouts, and Northwestern was surrendering six or seven yards of play. And I think most Northwestern fans thought, oh boy, here we go again. Northwestern looks amazing, going to blow the game, uh, and Maryland's going to take the lead with, I don't know, 30 seconds left. But there was a pass by Tungavailoa down the sideline, I want to say it was to one of his tight ends, where he led him way too far up the field. If he hit him in stride in the chest, it was going to be probably a 30 yard gain. Maryland would have been inside the red zone with a minute to go. And that just kind of epitomized the game it was for Tonga by Lois. So, on one hand, yes, Northwestern's defense played a very good game altogether. I believe had six sacks, which was the most in, I want to say, six years. Aiden Hubbard won Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week with three sacks of his own. The Wildcats forced two takeaways for the second straight game, a really encouraging sign there for a defense that has struggled to be opportunistic this year, especially on clutch time with Coco Ozma getting that late interception scenario before it hit the ground. But at the same time, the Northwestern defense still gave up plenty of separation, allowed almost 400 yards to Maryland, 27 points. So I don't know that David Braun was exactly um, euphoric with the defensive performance per se as the defensive coordinator, but uh, talent wise, I think there's no question that most of the teams that Northwestern is playing against Iowa, Wisconsin coming up are for sure a lot more talented, but um, we're starting to see some of that coaching play a role, and that's where I think David Braun has just excelled as a head coach and um, minimized that that deficiency with really good coaching and inspiring his players to go out and compete. There are some parallels with these two programs, Mark. You think about the fact that – I mean, first of all, there were a lot of parallels when, when Coach Fitz was there. Uh, ironically enough, Coach Fitz was in Kinnick here a few weeks ago uh, showcasing his, his two kids. But uh, the, the reason I bring up the parallels is because, I mean – preseason you have a, a late coaching change kind of a weird coaching change not a, a lot of people expected given the uh, if you want to call it the sca the hazing scandal involving fits and you jump into a season all of a sudden under very different circumstances and although brian ference is still going to be a part of this offense for the final four to five games this is not something iowa fans expected a week and a half ago to be dealing with uh, a coordinator shift or at least an announcement as people keep saying this idea of a lame duck offensive coordinator um, I will say this. Uh, I, I cannot imagine uh, I was uh, secondary giving up what Maryland gave up. And I don't even know what were what were what's his face's finals. What's the quarterback's name again? Brandon Should... Sullivan is going to be the oh, starting what... quarterback in this one. He, he is the backup, but Ben Bryant is expected to be out again per David Braun. Yeah. And so is Sullivan, you think Sullivan's won the job if Bryant comes back? I don't think so. I think Sullivan has definitely had flashes, even against Nebraska. We saw it a little bit, too. He had some nice plays where really, uh, really strong in particular. He kind of evaded pressure, stepped up in the pocket and, and hit Bryce Kurtz down the sideline in stride for a 66 yard gain. And Northwestern did nothing really after that on offense and had to settle for a field goal. But this was kind of the game we finally saw 
everything that had been in a pan materialized for Sullivan. The run game, he had 57 rushing yards. That was almost 30 more yards than any other Wildcat. Uh, he was effective on the ground, really strong through the air. He had three big-time throws per pro football focus. A Wildcat quarterback hadn't done that in a game since the Citrus Bowl in 2021 for context, which is uh, almost two full seasons um, beyond that. So uh, I don't think Sullivan has won the job. I think he's still looking for that consistency. And whether or not that appears this week against Iowa is probably going to dictate how a lot of this game goes. But there's no question that Northwestern knows that Ben Bryant is a starting quarterback. David Braun established that even in – uh, July at Big Time Media Day is basically saying this team needs an ultimate bona fide starting quarterback. It is Ben Bryant. He's been pretty solid for most of the year. Basically, the question is just when is he going to be healthy enough to return? And right now, it's still too early to say that. Somebody told me uh, last night on our live show with Coach Patterson, I think total margin last year, point differential last year for Northwestern was like, was it like 160 or something insane like that? I, I've never heard of a, a number quite like that. And you know, I mean, I understand that Northwestern right now, they're, they're playing potentially for a bowl berth. I mean, they win this Saturday. Uh, they're probably going to make a bowl game. I mean, they yeah. got a couple of winnable games left on the schedule, including a rivalry game against Illinois that would end up, if they win this Saturday, would end up being a play-in for a bowl game. But um, it's amazing, the differential. I mean, they've played some good teams this year. You think about, uh, you know, the loss to Penn State, of course. Um, you know, Rutgers, I think that game at Rutgers, Piscataway, that's the one game I've watched Northwestern from start to finish. And I wasn't really impressed with much of anything, but you got to remember, I mean, that was a first game following this colossal tenure from Pat Fitzgerald. And I, I'm not saying that affected them. Rutgers is a, a dangerous team as well, but um, it just seems like after the Duke manhandling, they've just been a different team. And I think about, you know, Nebraska, Nebraska's defense. I know they play in a weak offensive division, but they rank top 25 in, almost every defensive metric that you can imagine. So um, I don't know. So, I mean, they've been with the exception of being Penn state and that's one of the best teams they were with Penn state. Let's not forget that game was yeah. close at half time. Uh, mm -hmm. What a week after Penn state pulled Iowa's pants down. So I, you know, I, I think fans ought to get ready, be ready for a weird game. Also uh, Kirk brought up the only other time he's ever coached in a baseball stadium was the pinstripe bowl back in 2017. Everybody was slipping around and sliding around on the ice I'm wondering, do you know, Bradley, given the fact that you're a, a Northwestern guy, other games have been played at Wrigley, field conditions, I mean, it's not going to be that cold, so I wouldn't think we're going to have a problem with ice, you know, an icy uh, field, icy turf like we had out at Yankee Stadium, but um, what are conditions like? Is it is it windier than, a, than you know, playing over at uh, Ryan Field, or what can we expect? I don't know if that much is going to be different. And I guess even though I do cover Northwestern pretty religiously, I don't know if I consider myself a stadium expert in terms of playing a football game in a baseball stadium versus in a football stadium. The one thing logistically that will be unique is that uh, both teams will be using the same sideline. So they'll be kind of splitting that in half. And David Braun mentioned that uh, when we talked to him yesterday, that it will present some basically unique challenges is what he said. And the teams will have to get accustomed to coming in from the same direction. Um, I don't know if that much of this game is going to be that different. I mean, there will probably be unique graphics that, that are shown at Wrigley Field. Maybe take me out to the ball game will be sung at some point. Uh, they'll see the foul poles and the Ivy and all the traditional accoutrement of, of Wrigley Field. But uh, I still am expecting predominantly Iowa fans, 75 to 80 percent Iowa fans, at least just given this game is in the Chicago area. And as you mentioned, it's it's still an Iowa Northwestern game. It's still Big Ten West football. There's a reason the over under was set at 29 and a half. I don't think playing this game in Wrigley Field is going to change a whole lot of the identities of these of these two teams. It just kind of adds another layer of um, a special element to this game and puts it on a bigger stage, even though it won't be broadcast on that big of a stage being on Peacock. But now, if I really wanted to go there, I would I would make some kind of comment as to whether how Michigan would handle being on the same sideline with their <laughs> opponent. I, I don't know how that would work. And I don't know if that makes it easier, more difficult, whatever. <laughs> Got plenty of our Michigan contingent here. All right. Then the other thing that I, I, I thought of when you talked about uh, both teams being on the same sideline, and it's not super unique. It happens in bowl games, baseball stadiums. Um, but let's say if, if the play's down at the 10 yard line, one of the teams has to cross past the other team to get to their side of the football. If mm -hmm. you think about that. So I don't know if there's any kind of, they obviously aren't going to charge right through the other team. I wonder if there's some kind of a protocol as do you got to kind of run 
in the open part of the field and circle around to your side of the football. It's kind of strange. Yeah, it is going to be weird, but I did have the memory of you talked about the slipping in the pinstripe bowl. Well, two years ago when Northwestern took on Purdue in Wrigley Field, there was a little bit of slipping, but it was primarily th from Purdue's kicker. He had two accidental onside kicks, just basically lost his footing on two kickoffs, and I believe Purdue got both of them. So that added to the, the weirdness of the game. Uh, also, Milton Wright for Purdue had three touchdowns in that game, which you almost never see happen in a Big Ten West game, especially between Northwestern and Purdue. Um, so it was definitely memorable in a lot of ways. And I guess I'm sure the field has probably been tweaked uh, and, and has been tested and things like that to make sure similar things don't happen. But Iowa fans are used to giving up three touchdowns to a Purdue wide receiver, just for the record, Bradley, uh, which is ironic given Phil Parker and the Iowa defense, what they stand for. I think it's interesting you said 70, you expect 75 to 80% of the crowd be Iowa fans. And I said that to Mark, I mean, we said that months ago when this was initially announced, I said it's going to be a home game basically for Iowa. But if it's 75 to 80%, that's going to be astonishing. I mean, astonishing. Now, I watched part of, you know, I watched part of uh, Northwestern Maryland just a little bit, and I'll try to watch that back uh, in whole before I come out with my preview this week. There was nobody in the stands, there's yeah. nobody at these games. I mean, uh, how many? What was the official? Can I look this official? What do you want to guess? Nineteen thousand. Oh, it's way under nineteen thousand. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna guess it was probably like eleven thousand. But oh, but you, I think the official number was nineteen. Really? I think I did look at it because I I watched some of the game as well, and I thought, how many people are at this game? <laughs> the, you're right. The, the official count was nineteen thousand. That has to be total number of tickets sold, not actual bodies and seats. Yeah, I mean, I was actually not physically present at the game. I was um, engineering it for our radio station in the studio. But I mean, just looking, seeing it on TV and even just walking over across campus, it was probably 1045. And you would usually see a lot of Northwestern students bustling and getting with one another to go to games and wait for the bus shuttle. And there was I basically saw nobody at all. And for context, I mean, it was the Saturday after the Friday of Halloween weekend. And a lot of people like going out and doing stuff. Um, so an early kick and Northwestern taking on a team that a lot of people thought was just going to dominate the Wildcats definitely paired for a pretty bad matchup, not to mention the fact that it was significantly colder than it had been earlier last week. It was in the really the 60s and 70s and it dropped all the way down to 40s and 50s. So it was kind of a death knell when that happened. And at least the people who were there uh, definitely got to relish in a really good win. So I'm happy for them. Hmm. I, I'm not necessarily going to buy any of those um, reasons, but I, I get them. I get them. I, I'm not saying that they they are not part of the equation, but wow, a Big Ten team that. Uh, hmm. Anyway, um, now I forget where I was headed after this. Um, You're going to make fun of Northwestern some more, Mark. <laughs> I'm not making fun of Northwestern. It's just it's, it astounds me. Let's consider that if anything, people should be galvanized, energized to get behind this team that was supposed to be a one win football team. You know, had we known at the beginning of the season, had we had the Wagner score revealed to us 23, 20, I think all of us would have said, okay, they beat Wagner by three. That's their one win They're They're going to be awful the rest of the year because that's what most people anticipated. If anything, people should be a little excited that this team is competing and now winning. They've, they've beaten two teams that are pretty good football teams. Let me just say this, and no disrespect to, to Northwestern, Bradley, and, I, and I've said several times this week, this is a dangerous game for Iowa, but Iowa has no business losing. They have no business going there and losing. They just don't. If they go there and lose, it will be an awful loss, a terrible loss. And the wheels could come off if that happens. Now, they probably won't because Kirk Ferentz is a, a great head coach who understands how to um, get his guys to be resilient, but... They've had a week to recover from a really weird loss against Minnesota. I just now I will say this: two years ago, you want to, you know what happened in the game two years ago for some, this? I it was brought to my attention because last night you had the you saw the the sign from the Iowa fan behind home play the oh, World yeah. Series. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see that, Mark? I did. No. There was a big. It was a Hawkeye fan, and in fact, I think he's. I, I saw on Twitter that I believe he's. Um. I don't even think he's an Iowa graduate. I think he's a Central College graduate, which is down in Pella, Iowa. Um, but they figured out who it was. But a big a guy with a big Tiger Hawk right behind home play of the World Series. And then at one point in the game, he had a little sign that all it said was, it was not a fair catch. <laughs> I thought that was great. But the reason I bring that up um, is back in 2000, 
uh, let's see, 2021. Uh, what was it? How, how far in the game? How long into the game did that happen, Bradley? You had a couple. You had some students just. Oh yeah. All of a sudden, just took over the game. It's just like it was a a, a coup. I mean, they just took over the game. And the yeah. TV crews, the referees, everybody just got off the field, and these students were on the field protesting, had these big signs and banners. Don't you remember that, Mark? And <laughs> Vaguely, I remember it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it's like, well, what's happening here? Well, apparently, we've got a protest going on, and nobody yeah. was doing anything. You see these baseball games where these, you know, these uh, security guards go and lower their shoulder and, you know, pull a Jadavion Clowney type of move on these guys, and yet these protesters are allowed to be at midfield for like 15 minutes just holding their signs up. I've never no, seen anything I, like it. I vividly remember that because that was actually the first ever football game I covered in a press box, so it was definitely an introduction mm -hmm. uh, to the weirdness of the Big Ten West, I guess, but I want to say it was the third quarter. It was definitely the latter portion of the game, and my editors and I were kind of looking at each other and just texting and thinking, what, what do we really do here? How much do we cover this? It's not technically the game. So there were uh, a lot of uh, delicate conversations that were had for sure. But that, that game itself, I think it ended 17 to 12 um, Iowa, which is probably maybe about what the score could be this time around too. Padilla started that game, right? Yeah, he did. That line was bad. No, no, I'm sorry. No, he did not start that game. Petrus played first quarter. Oh, yeah. He was bringing it up. Yeah. Then they took him out, yanked him. Padilla did not play well. But I remember thinking, hey, uh, you know, he did enough, and, and that's what you want from that's what Kirk wants out of his Iowa quarterbacks right now is to do enough to get a win and just not lose them the game. Northwestern would be the place that I would expect above any other Big Ten stadium where that would go on longer than anywhere else. Number one, just because of the type of school it is, it is a journalism school. It, there There is a bent toward such things. And then on top of that, obviously, there's less people in the stadium. You know, I can't imagine in Happy Valley or Ohio Stadium with 110,000 people watching the game and wanting football that <laughs> that would go on too long before there would be some kind of riot going in the other direction. Yeah, and the one defense for Northwestern in the small crowd would be that obviously it's, it's a it's a small school. Mm -hmm. so they're not no, drawing they're from. Roll. 50, and I mean, the student people. section, even at capacity, is probably a maximum of. 800 2000 people but it was not close to capacity against maryland uh, usually the games fill up student wise and really overall attendance wise well into the first quarter uh just people trickling in after going to tailgates and especially an 11 a.m kick is is just not going to help with those efforts but i do think it's going to be a really substantial crowd uh when northwestern played purdue a big contingent of northwestern fans went to that game it was still mostly boilermakers fans i would say but i mean you just know it's going to be a pretty solid entertaining game iowa northwestern two traditional rivals, a big game for both teams, uh, as you guys have alluded to in the Big Ten West standings. And I think a lot of Northwestern fans, even though they may not be showing up to games at Ryan Field, are definitely feeling a sense of positive momentum and optimism regarding the program, which is absolutely necessary after not only this summer, but the last two years. So I think people will, will go out in droves. And I would expect pretty much close to a sellout for this one. Uh, what's the capacity of Wrigley? Do we know that? I want to like say 30, forty something thousand, but I like think a little high. for baseball. I would think it'd be pretty packed. I can't yeah, imagine. 40, Forty-one thousand six hundred forty-nine is the official capacity. Is that You're for baseball? Right. They they must have put more seats in there. Um, it used to be thirty-seven something, forty-one. Okay. And and we can trust that they have now figured out how to set the football field within the baseball field. Yeah, that is that is right. I mean, yeah. there there definitely will be two end zones this time around, unlike in 2013 when Northwestern took on Illinois and there was the teams were going the same direction. There there were definitely two uh, end zones. I think part of what was fun about the game was I don't think they were kicking nets or there was something weird where the when people would attack extra points or field goals, the balls would go into the stands and, and students would just catch them being in the bleachers. So we'll see if that happens again this time around. You remember this, right, Corey, where both yeah. offenses had to be run in the same direction. They had to do all the kickoffs in the same direction because the the end zone on one end ran into the brick wall. So they couldn't I, have I any vaguely, plays in, the, in that end zone. I vaguely remember that. I'm assuming that's been remedied because I haven't heard anything about that happening again. I, I don't understand how you could even defend doing that. I mean, I just don't understand. Well, what if you think play? about it, there's never going to be a play in that end zone as long. Even if there's a pick six, as soon as he crosses the goal line, it's a touchdown. Like, you you don't need the corners of the end zone. But, yeah, it negates the whole idea of the way the game structured is. You trade, flip, 
ends of the field and you play with different wind or against the wind and all that business. Yeah. Sunlight, everything, everything that goes yeah. into playing outdoors. Uh, it's not an AFL game. You know, the, the Iowa Barnstormers. I don't know if the, I don't even know what league they're in now, but I'm assuming they still, they're still playing down in Des Moines. But Mark, you know about AFL football where the receivers are getting a running head start at the line of scrimmage and then, you know, they their end zone is literally up against the wall. So you have guys trying to catch the ball in the stands and all this nonsense. Mm. <laughs> so it's not gonna hopefully it's not gonna be that way with a brick wall. I hope not. Yeah, I don't think so. That's good news. All right. Uh Bradley Locker, you can catch his work at insidenu.com. It's on SB Nation. Bradley, I'm sure you've got a lot of different uh looks at the game on uh SB Nation. Yeah, for sure. We have, uh, I mean, we, we had the presser notes go up this week from what David Braun said, a lot more coverage. Previewing, we had a story go up today, kind of three matchups to watch in this game. One of them was about the over-under and whether the teams will hit that. Uh, we'll have more about why Northwestern will or won't win, all that type of stuff coming up. So definitely a lot more on our end. Bradley, we appreciate you stopping by. Thank you for the breakdown. Yeah, of course, guys. Thanks so much. And always love speaking to you guys. I want to say it's the third straight year I've done this, which kind of makes me feel really old, even though I'm only a junior in college. But it's it's really nice to be back here for sure. Yeah, I cannot in any way accept that statement. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you've got a plenty of time. Yeah. So enjoy the game. It should be an interesting one. As as Corey notes, uh, weird things could happen in this one for sure. Oh, yeah, I would expect plenty of weird things. Let me just say that. Thanks, Bradley. Thanks so much, guys. All right, we do have a couple of super chats we need to hit before we say goodbye. And I have another. I have a question for you as as well before we say goodbye regarding Iowa football. Super chat coming in from Scott. If you kill wins, how does Deacon ring in FBS? Can you interpret that statement? Rank. I'm guessing. Oh, he meant how rank. does he rank in wins? Well, no, he said if you kill wins. In other words, we're not counting wins towards his resume. Oh, how does he rank in the FBS? Well, uh, I haven't I, done a deep study, but it would be extremely low. But I probably dead last in anybody that has more than you know two starts, dead last. I mean, he's had games where he's thrown for like 30 yards. Yeah. <laughs> his completion percentage is like less than 40. The only thing he has not done up until the Minnesota game was turn the ball over. Yeah, but Correct. well, no, that's that's not totally true. Uh, didn't he? Well, I don't mean at all, but he's not been turnover prone no. until the Minnesota well, you go game. Back, you go back to that Wisconsin game, and I was in Camp Randall for that. There were several opportunities dropped by Badgers, by Badger defenders on you know passes that were way too low and tipped at the line of scrimmage or knocked up in the air. Well, I think one hit a guy's helmet. Um, so no, it hasn't been good. All right. So Scott is also asking, what is our bye week record? Well, to be technical, it's zero and zero during the bye. But uh, yes, uh, after a bye. Yeah, I don't I don't know uh, recent history. I mean, I can anecdotally, I can tell you that uh, last year they played. Was that last year they played? Uh, no, it's two years ago. They played Wisconsin out of a bye and got whooped up in Camp Randall. I'm trying to think of who they played last year out of the bye. Maybe somebody can tell me. Um, they may have won. They may not have. I, I don't remember. Um, I will say this and I, I, I don't want to derail this. I know we're trying to wrap things up. I had this, I brought this up yesterday. Mark, you know, what job is very, very, I think, intriguing to follow. What big 10 job is going to be an intriguing one to follow when the season's over. As it relates to Iowa. As it relates relates to Iowa. Iowa. I was going to say Michigan State is the first one that comes to mind. Bingo. Bingo. That's the job that to me. Why is it interesting to follow? I believe Kirk will probably be back, but I've been saying for months, I think this might be his last year. And now with the Brian situation, I think it's even more possible, probable. But if somehow Kirk leaves after this season, say he says, I'm, I'm done with this situation. I'm, you know, I don't want to continue without Brian, etc." If he leaves, Iowa fans will say, Hey, how can we keep Phil Parker? But at that point, the question becomes, does Phil Parker want to be a DC with whoever the next Iowa coach is? Does he want to be the head coach at Iowa or might he reconsider his Option the options he's had in the past to go somewhere else, 
And might the one place he would go be Michigan State? He's a former Michigan State player. Um, I think he's not like he's had opportunities there in the past. Nobody expected that job to be open. Nobody expected that job to be open a couple of months ago. And with the scandal involving Mel Tucker, it is it's going to be interesting. I hope those stars don't align. But that could be a job to follow in the offseason. I talked about maybe LeVar Woods to Northwestern. That's more of just a specul- speculative um, proposition. But Phil Parker to Michigan State makes sense, especially if Kirk walks away. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope Kirk stays. I hope he hires the best offensive mind that's out there. I know a lot of people think he won't. A lot of people think he'll just throw in Judd, John Budmeyer or somebody he's comfortable with. And we can talk about candidates another day, Mark. Um, I've got a number that we've penciled in from our show yesterday, fans submitted, etc. cetera. But, um, boy, it's going to be an interesting coming three to four months for Iowa football. It most certainly will. Uh, everyone catch Corey at uh, from the Hawkeye at the Storm. Uh, daily coverage on the Hawkeyes. Northwestern's coming up on Saturday. And, of course, the post game as well with Corey and Coach Don Patterson. And right here at the Voice of College Football over on the main channel, we get together here in just about a half hour to uh, take in the college football playoff rankings, the first unveiling, and we will take your calls as well. Corey, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the game this weekend, and we will see you on the post game show. Sounds good, Mark. Thanks.